Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSENG, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, how were sexual assault allegations handled? Legislative hearings into an allegation of rape in state government turned to the question of why no one told the governor and what took so long to fire the accused. In a preemptive strike, Jersey Democrats warn viewers the president's speech tonight on border security could include, quote, lies and fear mongering as the government shutdown continues. After a raucous meeting, Governor Jim McGreevy is ousted from his position with the New Jersey reentry program. So what does it mean going forward? One community organization is stopping gun violence by intervening before retaliation. And an old brand could have staying power yet. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. How could a man accused of rape be given a top job in the Murphy administration? That question before an investigative committee today looking to find the weaknesses in the state's policies for handling sexual assault. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron was there to hear testimony. Paramel Garg is a deputy chief counsel to the governor. He told the committee that at the inaugural ball last year, Katie Brennan told him of serious misconduct by a Murphy administration official, but wouldn't say what it was. Then in March, she finally told Garg and his boss, Chief Counsel Matt Platkin, she had been raped by Al Alvarez. Committee lawyer Michael Critchley honed in on that. Either of you did not say we should, we should take some steps beyond just saying, okay, well, let's wait to see what happens. Both of us felt that we should respect her wishes and her decision not to come forward. Well, I understand you're respecting her wishes, but as a, as, a, as a public official, as a government official, when you have someone you believe who's holding a high-ranking position telling you that there's serious wrongdoing involving a senior administration official, we all have to make judgment calls, don't we, as, as lawyers? We do have to make judgment and when, calls. And when you are a lawyer, deputy chief counsel to the governor, when you have these clauses coming together, doesn't your judgment tell you, we better take some action on this and follow we, up? We didn't have any specifics as to what that serious wrongdoing might entail. I, I know, that's the problem. You have to find out because you have explosive words, serious wrongdoing. Critchley pressed him on why they didn't tell the governor. Do you think, based upon your position as deputy chief counsel, that when you found out and Matt Placken found out in March of 2018 that the governor had a legitimate need to know that a senior official in the administration had accused another senior, that a senior official in the administration had accused another senior administration official of rape. Do you think he had a legitimate need to know? I don't report directly to the governor, so I, I don't believe that was my call to make. I'm not saying it, but I'm asking you, do you think he had a legitimate need to know that a member of his administration had been accused of rape by another member of the administration? I can't speculate on that without knowing all the specific information. Then Katie Brennan sent an email to the governor about a sensitive matter, she said. Murphy forwarded it to Platkin and campaign attorney Jonathan Burkhan, and those two decided it was time for Alvarez to leave state government. Committee co-chair Loretta Weinberg was skeptical. So there are several people who are, at least two people, if not more, who were discussing a rape allegation. And the only one that is, seems to be kept confidential from in terms of what's going on is actually the victim. Co-chair Eliana Pinter Marin asked Burkhan about not informing the governor. You didn't think it was responsible of you as an attorney to tell the governor that this was going on under his administration and that possibly could cause problems? And I did not feel it was my place to insert myself and inform the governor, but that it, to the extent that that communication needed to happen, that that would have happened on the administration side. Alvarez has denied the allegation against him. He was eventually allowed to resign from state government in October. Senator Sandra Cunningham invoked the Me Too movement 
and expressed frustration at how lives on both sides are being affected. It's just very difficult for me to understand that because of the severity of the allegations that you, as the attorney who was brought into this, felt no other responsibility other than to say, um, I recommend or I think that Mr. Alvarez should be um, terminated. It seems to me that as an attorney, you would have a greater responsibility here. Murphy's transition director, Jose Lozano, also testified. He had heard about an allegation against Alvarez, but Katie Brennan was still anonymous at that point. He was asked why he still didn't conduct an investigation. It's difficult to do an investigation when you don't have an accuser. Governor Murphy was asked for comment today. I would have no further comment on the on the Brennan hearings. I've said everything that I could say other than we're cooperating as long as these are not political. The committee is wrestling with the issues raised by the Katie Brennan case. On Thursday, Chief of Staff Pete Camerano is scheduled to resume his testimony. Chief Counsel Matt Platkin's testimony has been pushed off to a later date. At the State House, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. Tonight, in a primetime address from the Oval Office, the president is expected to make a pitch for a wall along the nation's southern border. Building one is his condition for reopening the government. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports New Jersey's U.S. senators are issuing a warning. This president repeatedly lies to the American people. Top Jersey Democrats launched a preemptive media strike at Newark Airport as the partial government shutdown hit day 18 and the president prepared to, as he tweeted, address the nation on the humanitarian and national security crisis on our southern border. Democrats questioned Trump's credibility, noting his Oval Office address should come with a warning to viewers. And that warning is the comments you are about to hear are not based on fact and are likely to include misinformation, blatant lies, and fear-mongering. This president took responsibility for the shutdown. Now he's trying to shift blame. This president said that Mexico would pay for his wall. Now he's trying to make American taxpayers pay for it and doing it on the backs of our federal workers by hurting them. Democrats called for Trump to end the shutdown, but the vice president argued immigrants at the southern border have created a real crisis. And on Good Morning America today, he attempted to defend Trump against charges of mendacity. The American people aren't as concerned about the political debate as they are concerned about what's really happening at the border. We need new resources, we need to build a wall. We need the Congress to come to the table and work with this president to address this crisis once and for all. If Trump declares a national state of emergency in an attempt to fund his wall, Senator Bob Menendez says it'll end up in court. Trying to declare a national emergency for something that is purely a political purpose just won't fly. 5,000 federal workers in New Jersey are among 800,000 who've been furloughed or forced to work without pay during the shutdown, including air traffic controllers and TSA screeners. TSA's union demanded an end to the shutdown, calling it completely unacceptable that the women and men who risk their lives safeguarding our airports are still required to report for work without knowing when they'll be paid again. TSA officials worry that even more screeners will call out sick if they don't get paychecks this Friday. Some travelers empathized. People work better when they're compensated for what they're doing, right? So uh, even though folks have a mindset of, you know, service and protecting the public, it, it, it has a negative impact when, you know, you have to go home and don't know how you can pay your bills, right? Among those furloughed, Michael Jesse, who stood in Terminal B with a sign warning travelers that FAA safety inspectors are not on the job. No one is watching to see if the uh, operations are being conducted safely, and no one is making sure that all maintenance is being conducted in accordance with the rules and regulations. I still think it's safe for Americans to fly, but as I said earlier, you have to recognize when you create stress on the system, that that stress eventually leads to the potential for error. The president scheduled to speak at 9 p.m., followed by a rebuttal from Speaker Pelosi and Minority Leader Schumer. There are no new talks yet scheduled to end the government shutdown. In Newark, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News.
Sears may stay open. Standing by with that and all the state's business news is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, one of the most iconic names in retail, Sears, may have just been saved from a complete liquidation. The bankrupt retailer has reached an agreement with its chairman, Eddie Lampert, who's seeking to preserve the company and save tens of thousands of jobs. Lampert's hedge fund had previously offered $4.4 billion for Sears. Today, a bankruptcy court ruled Lampert must put down a $120 million deposit by tomorrow afternoon. Lampert's bid is not official. It still must be evaluated at an auction set for next week. His bid will compete with others from liquidators who are trying to shut the entire company down. But if Lampert prevails, he would keep 425 Sears stores open, including 27 Sears and Kmart stores that are still operating here in New Jersey. Another retailer has reached a settlement with the state over a data breach. Hackers obtained data stored by Neiman Marcus in 2013, compromising customer account numbers and other personal data. Approximately 17,000 accounts in New Jersey were impacted by that breach. Neiman Marcus will pay the state more than $57,000 as part of a multi-state settlement. Financial help is on the way for workers impacted by the government shutdown as banks and credit unions are making offers to assist. Provident Bank here in New Jersey says it will cancel mortgage and credit card late fees for federal workers who are without paychecks. Navy Federal Credit Union and the U.S. Employees Credit Union are offering their members 0% loans, as are several other credit unions that count federal employees and in some cases contractors as their members. Wall Street executives have recently met with several potential 2020 Democratic candidates for president, including Senator Cory Booker, according to business website CNBC. CNBC reports that Democratic financiers have also met with California Senator Kamala Harris. Senator Booker did not respond to the website's request for comment. Wall Street has been good to Senator Booker in prior campaigns. According to Open Secrets, the securities and investment industry has donated a total of $2.8 million to Booker over the years, ranking him in 19th place among all U.S. senators. Stock market closing out the day with some gains. The Dow rose 256 points. And those are your top business stories. More money for education. Governor Murphy has signed into law two bills aimed at increasing security for religious schools, houses of worship, and community centers. This in response to an increase in religious bias incidents in the state and across the country. The new laws signed at a yeshiva in Passaic expand the type of protective measures that can be built at houses of worship and community centers, including hardening physical targets and hiring additional security personnel, and provides $11 million to double security funding for non-public schools. It's up to us to set the right tone. So there's no amount of money, even though this is a huge step in the right direction, there's no amount of money we can put up against what ails us in the absence of leadership that is embracing, inclusive, that reminds us that we are all in this together. The governor also announced two new education grants. The first, a $10.6 million federal grant to improve early childhood education. The second, a $750,000 grant from the state education department for a program to recruit, prepare, support, and place a diverse pool of teachers that better reflect the diversity of New Jersey's student population. Those grants will be shared by Montclair State University, which will partner with Newark Public Schools, and Rutgers University that will work with charter schools in Passaic County. Former Governor Jim McGreevy is out of a job. After six years running Jersey City's prisoner reentry program, he's been summarily fired, just as he predicted to us yesterday. Brianna Venosi was there for the vote. I've been around uh, this board for 18 years and there's been politics as, as it will be, but I've never seen the tentacles of politics so deeply entrenched 
Former Governor Jim McGreevy is out of a job, his fate all but sealed even before entering this standing room only meeting of trustees of the nonprofit he's led since 2013. In a five to three vote with one abstention, the board quickly moved to terminate McGreevy, but not before hearing from more than two dozen supporters. Asked to attend via email by the governor himself, who calls his ousting political retaliation. I was appalled. <clears throat> I was appalled and I was scared because he's the only one that looked at a person like myself, That's like good. a human yes. being. Yes. I smell politics. I smell politics going on. I'm just asking for the truth and I would ask the board members, indeed those new board members, many of which this is their first board meeting, mm -hmm. to give me a single reason why I am being terminated. McGreevy says he's being removed because he fell out of favor with Jersey City Mayor Steve Fulop. Fulop appointed the former governor as executive director at the Jersey City Employment and Training Program known as Martin's Place. But McGreevy insists things went sour after he fired a Fulop political operative and says Fulop began replacing board members with his political allies, including the chairman and JC Board of Education president Sudan Thomas. Thomas will take over as interim executive director without pay for six months. What are the grounds for termination then? Like I said, this is a HR personal issues. We can't, you know, talk about the grounds as such, but all I can say, which I have said repeatedly in public is, that the JSEP is an authority of the city. The city is referring all questions to the board, reiterating their allegations. Thomas says McGreevy has focused too many resources for people outside the city. Fulop accused him of misappropriating funds. McGreevy denies all of it. In a surprising vote favoring McGreevy, board member and Fulop appointee Jake Hudnut called the entire situation troubling. There are ways that your concerns, our concerns, some of which are my concerns about JSEP can be addressed in a rational way. I strongly urge those board members who are undecided to vote no. Hudnut also took issue with the board's hasty vote, hiring an attorney and auditor for JCETP. Public contracts that'll cost more than $50,000 a year for the nonprofit. Several board members urged the vote after an attorney for McGreevy sent a letter threatening to sue if he was fired. In the end, McGreevy pledged to continue his work. He handed over his keys and was escorted out. I have personally a friendship with the governor. I am just completely appalled and disappointed that every time we've had a meeting, these folks have shown up and they have been told that their services are going to be disrupted and they're going to be on the streets. And I'll say shame on McGreevy. So the board says tomorrow these doors will open, services will be available, and it'll be business as usual. The only difference is Governor McGreevy won't be on the job. In Jersey City, Brianna Venosi, NJ TV News. Adapting community policing policies to prisons. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Cape May Courthouse, where the county's new $37 million correctional facility has big changes in store for inmates, but bigger changes for corrections officers who will spend their 12-hour shifts mingling with inmates in common areas open to all but maximum security prisoners. The five housing units have double cells and day rooms with TVs and game tables, phones with screens to allow virtual visitors visits and new exercise areas. The officers have been trained in interpersonal communications so they can come to know the inmates and help them work through issues. It's a style of prison management Sheriff Robert Nolan is quoted as saying is safer for both guards and inmates. Next to Atlantic City, where Ralph E. Hunter Sr. leads an active life, the 81-year-old founder and president of the African American Heritage Museum of Southern New Jersey oversees operations both here and in the museum's Newtonville location. But recently, the historian permitted a peek inside his private space, where the walls are adorned with photos of Mr. Hunter's parents and grandparents and art created by his grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Also, art depicting Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Ramona Africa, the only adult survivor of the 1985 MOVE bombing in Philadelphia. A statue of the Godfather of Soul, the late James Brown, sits on a table. Once it gets new batteries, it can dance. Mr. Hunter calls the room his happy place. 
Finally, Galloway Township, where tweens took over the Grand Hall at Stockton University's Campus Center for an egg toss. The exercise of engineering packaging for raw eggs that prevent them from breaking when dropped off a balcony was part of Stockton's annual tween tech program for middle schoolers. In partnership with the American Association of University Women, the STEM event was open to 200 girls from all over South Jersey who attended workshops on photo editing, creating lasers, designing computer games, and making lip gloss. They're tweens. But the Humpty Dumpty Save the Egg Egg Drop Challenge, at least one chucked off the balcony, didn't crack a yolk. And that's our Garden State Express for Tuesday, January 8th. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. Last week, we reported that crime in Newark has reached a five-decade low. Officials give much of the credit to cops on the streets. Joanna Gagas found community intervention at work as well. A young man is shot. He wakes up in the hospital and wants to retaliate. That's where the Newark Community Street Team comes in. It's a nonprofit made up of guys and girls from the neighborhood who intervene in disputes around the city. They're trying to prevent more gun violence. It's a mentorship. We, we don't let a 48 hour window go without contacting them and seeing where they're at in their transition because being a victim of gun violence is um, something tremendous and it's a, it's a traumatic situation. Here in North Community Street Team, we had an um, individual who were actually shot each other. We mediated those situations to a peaceful outcome. They say many of the violent altercations are over simple problems. Mostly over a girl or some form of adolescent stuff that we could have got ahead of before it had to get to this uh, stream of violence. Because of the intensity of the situations, team members go through rigorous conflict resolution training. If two groups have a conflict, if you tell them, listen, man, one, you tell group one that group two don't want no problem, group two might look at that as a sign of weakness. Man, I told you they were scared, ain't you know what I'm saying? So with these um, conflicts, resolution, they, they, they're delicate. So you don't want to change the balance of power between them. So how do you how do you talk to them? What do you say? Separately, you say, hey, man, you know what I'm saying? Would you be willing to talk to these guys? Just because y'all talk, that don't mean everything's squashed, but are you willing to talk? Yeah, man, I'm, you know, I see what he got to say and vice versa. This team is no stranger to the streets. Many have experienced gun violence and even prison. Some even came through the NCST program and by processing their own trauma are able to help others. Coming home from doing eight years in prison, it was like, I'm not about to get no job right now. But my mentor stayed on me like, bro, get out the streets. Being in the program t taught me I was a trauma victim. I didn't know no better. I thought it's just everything, this is what happens living in North, what it's like, nah, it's better, there's different ways to live. During my last incarceration, um, my, young, my younger brother uh, succumbed to gun violence. And um, that, excuse me, that really changed the way I thought coming home and to um, try to stop the cycle of violence. I refuse, I refuse to um, retaliate for my brother's death. And it still hurts me. Um, but um, I made that decision. And um, also, I said I will help people who are willing. Sometimes people reach out. Other times, this team just shows up, like their Safe Passage program, where they help keep kids safe on the way home from school. Their presence and their reputation gives them credibility with the kids. They're more likely to take help from somebody they know besides a stranger. You feel me? And then when you go around with someone, you hear NCST, oh, I heard about y'all, y'all doing good. Oh, let me tell you what's going on. Newark Mayor Raz Baraka has credited the organization with helping to drive down crime in the city, an effort this team says has just started. In Newark, Joanna Gagas and JTV News.
has some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. Office of Personnel Management data show there are 10,228 federal employees in New Jersey. In 2018, 101 fewer people were shot in Newark than the year before. Inmates are expected to move into the new Cape May County Jail in mid-January. And 56% of public school students are children of color, but just 16% of New Jersey's teachers are people of color. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, how many people are really leaving the Garden State? To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. Independent College Fund of New Jersey, in partnership with Investors Bank, supporting our community since 1926. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Have some water. Look at these kids. What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.